Hello and welcome back to another experimental soup. Now, today's experimental archaeology was actually inspired by a questions of doom, or rather a question of doom, which I received recently from a person called Joanne. Now, Joanne wanted to know how it is that archaeologists can say with any confidence whether something, say a pot or a bone or some glass, something that can fragment, whether it's been um, deposited and uh, stayed in situ, or whether actually it's been scuffed about, moved around prior to its deposition and eventual discovery by an archaeologist. In other words, when we say, oh, well, this, this, uh, this pot was found exactly where it fell, um, how do we know that? And that's a very good question. It's something which I have touched on in previous videos, but I've never really explained. Uh, for example, in my taphonomy video, and that's basically what we're talking about. We're talking about taphonomy, the, the processes which an artifact goes through post-deposition and some, in some cases pre-deposition uh, before it becomes part of the archaeological record, something which we later discover and, uh, and record. Incidentally, Joanne also wanted to know how we know such breaks aren't recent. Has an archaeologist simply smashed a pot and not owned up to it? Now, um, for today's experiment, if you, if you want to, to play along, uh, you're going to need a cup or a mug, something which isn't too special to someone in your family or you. Ideally, a broken cup or mug, something with a chip on it, something which, which, which is just maybe a hideous mug that you no longer like. But make sure you get permission of the mug owner um, before you do this, because basically you're going to smash this mug in the name of science. So, uh, assuming that you've found a mug which is suitable, Let's dive in. Hello and welcome back finally to the Archaeosoup workshop or shed. It's a fairly modest workshop at the moment but it's mine, darn it. Now as we've already discussed if you want to try something like this experiment at home you're going to need a mug which is not too beholden, not too beloved I suppose, of uh, a family member or a friend or a loved one uh, otherwise they will not like you. Ideally a chipped mug that no one wants anymore would be best. You need a mug, you're also going to need some safety goggles Unfortunately, I can't find my safety goggles today, so much to my shame, I'm going to rely on my sunglasses, which actually are fairly hardcore. They've, uh, they've seen me through some fairly difficult scrapes in the past. Scrapes? Uh, no, never mind. Um, so, <laughs> so we've got those things. You're also going to need a high-sided box in which to, to place uh, your mug, or rather in which to drop your mug, and also a hard surface onto which to drop it. So uh, without any further ado, what you need to do for the first part of this experiment is to, oh that's a screw, is to put on your safety goggles or sunglasses, <coughs> grab your mug or cup and then drop it from a great height into the box. Please note you may have to repeat the process a couple of times to get some pleasing sherds. Yeah, so <laughs> once you've uh, had a bit of wanton destruction with your mug, you may need to drop it into the box a couple of times to ensure maximum shardage. Um, but, uh, but also be very careful, again, make sure it's high-sided and that you do look after your eyes. Once you've done that, though, what you need to do is tip out the bits onto a tray. There we go. And then you need to divide these bits into two distinct groups. One will be a control group, i.e. the group which we don't do anything to, which you can compare the, um, the, the, the taphonomy to. The other one being the taphonomical group, as it were, the group that you're going to churn around uh, to create a hypothetical post-deposition um, experience. So uh, what we're going to do is divide those into two. So quickly, uh, two groups. Of course, always being careful with your fingers as well. Some of these, some of these sherds, some of these shards are really rather sharp, so be very careful with them. Now that you've got your two groups, what we need is a churner. And for those purposes, what I have, in fact, uh, um, what I've uh, brought in is uh, a bin. <laughs> but this bin will do, uh, will perform this role admirably. So you need to select one of your two groups, which is going to be subjected to the churning, and put them into the bin. So. I'm going to choose my right hand group here. And then you simply begin churning.
Now this isn't, uh, it's gonna actually gonna take a while. It's also not gonna be much fun for you to watch me looking down into a bucket. So um, tell you what, why don't you look at the processes which we're trying to, uh, to replicate by churning these pottery sherds and uh, come back in a few minutes. In churning the fragments, we're trying to replicate some of the stresses pottery can experience if it's moved around before deposition. It can be walked on, for example, on village floors or around rubbish dumps. It can also be disturbed by animals, such as the mole. In creating their famous mole hills, they also disturb, or rather can disturb, archaeological sites. This includes moving pottery around. We also have to remember the effect humans have in moving pottery around. Farming, particularly mechanical cultivation, can have a dramatic effect on pottery recovered from archaeological sites, churning up the soil as they go. Okay, so let's tip out the contents of the bin and see what we've got. Now immediately, what you'll notice is that there are far more uh, small fragments in this group here compared to this group here. This group, they're larger fragments and uh, basically because they haven't had little bits broken off them. This group here, uh, well, it's a mess, isn't it? There's lots of little bits all over the place and usually these little bits here will be lost to archaeology because they'll just dis disappear into the soil. Given enough time, they will wear almost to nothing. Sand-like molecules. But when you look closer at the two different groups, there's something even more um, uh, obvious and uh, more characteristic about the shards that will be recovered. So the bits that probably would be recovered would be these larger pieces here including for example this one and this one actually is a really good example um, of what I'm talking about. All the edges have been rounded off uh, and again given more time, this is a very short experiment, these edges will, be un will only become more and more round. Um, on this piece here you can see actually the, uh, the, the surface of the, pot, uh, of the pottery has become scratched and scarred. Again this will get worse over time. You can tell it's been moved around, it's not stayed in one place. When when you compare that to this here, yes it's a little bit dusty but it's actually fairly pristine, nice and smooth. Also the edges on the pottery are very sharp actually, almost uh, dangerous in some places. Um, this is because the edges have not been worn off through uh, movement, through the action of soil uh, and through, um, through the action of animals or, or people just kicking bits of, of, of pottery around. This, this stuff has stayed still in the ground and therefore it's fairly pristine. So that's roughly how we can tell whether uh, something has been left in one place, i.e. found in situ uh, for decades, uh, even hundreds of years, and something has been moved around, whether it be immediately after deposition or uh, before deposition, perhaps it has been scuffed around on the surface before being deposited in the ground. Um, the difference between these two different types of pottery are fairly distinct, and uh, you don't actually really need that much of a trained eye to spot the difference. But it is worth worthwhile understanding how it is that archaeologists come to these conclusions. Uh, they are uh, not just guessing, these are actually observable facts. Now in order to answer your second question, um, what I actually have got here is a shard which has been uh, soaking in soil for a little while. Essentially um, I've let it uh, take on some of the, well, some very early characteristics of having been buried for a while. So when you first recover a shard, for example, which has been buried for a long time, the first thing you'll notice is it actually is in fact dirty. This, this particular shard of pottery uh, has filthy edges. Now um, if this was broken recently, or indeed broken by an archaeologist, uh, what you would find is that the edge which is revealed is not quite so dirty. Now uh, I'm just going to uh, try and break this now. So once broken, once uh, recently broken, the first thing you'll notice is the distinct difference between the surface which has been in the soil for a long time and the surface which is newly exposed. The colour is distinct, it is in fact different. And that, in a nutshell, is how archaeologists know whether something has been broken recently or not. Um, it's to do with its exposure to the environment around it. If you are digging up a bone and you happen to, I don't know, slice it in two with a trowel, people will know because the colour is different, distinctly different. 
So there you have it Joanne, uh, the difference between uh, a breakable object which has been found in situ and a breakable object which has been moved around, scuffed about, churned up and otherwise interfered with is uh, usually the edges, the sharpened, the sharpened edges on a piece which has been uh, broken and then immediately buried and the less sharp more uh, more rounded more scuffed up surfaces of the pieces which have been moved around and interfered with um, similarly we can tell if something's been recently broken or not um, by the color of the the edge of the break uh, i.e a recent break will usually be lighter or paler um, or a distinct color compared to those su those surfaces which have been in contact with the soil for a while so hopefully this has gone some way to answering your question and also thank you so much for giving me a good excuse to get into the workshop and perform a bit of experimental archaeology. And I promise you next time I will have my safety goggles. They're, they're around here somewhere, I know they are. Until next time, please do take care. Bye bye. <laughs>